Outlaw. Cold-blooded killer. Victim of circumstance. The man, the myth, the legend, Billy the Kid. The very personification of the Wild West. Did he die at 21 years old? Ambushed by Sheriff Pat Garrett? Or did Garrett let the friend he called Little Casino vanish into the dark New Mexico night? I don't know about you, but I've always been fascinated by the American Wild West. A time when gold nuggets were found on the ground and family fortunes were made overnight. Stagecoaches, banks, trains were robbed by armed desperados, quite literally riding off into the sunset on horseback. Mustachioed men drinking warm whiskey neat in a dusty bar. Lawmen sitting next to gamblers, gamblers sitting next to cattle rustlers. Cattle rustlers sitting next to the very cattle barons they stole their cattle from. It was a time when insults were settled with pistols and brothels and poker tables were as common as tumbleweeds and rattlesnakes. So let's giddy up, you cowpokes. Slap on some spurs. Slip on your best 10-gallon hat. Pour yourself a tall glass of something that smells like gasoline and tastes much worse. And let's mosey on into this high noon, circle in the wagon showdown edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Welcome to the Wild Wild West Time Suck, everybody. And no, we will not be examining Will Smith's 1999 hit single. If you don't know what that song is, take my advice and don't look it up. You don't want that nonsense stuck in your head, I promise you. Very excited for today's show. Gotta love Westerns. Tombstone is my favorite movie of all time. I was, I was warming up for the podcast, uh, watching some of my favorite clips from that movie. Like the like the showdown between Doc Holliday and Johnny Ringo. I played for blood. God, it's so good. Yo no daisy, Johnny. Yo no daisy. Tombstone, oh man, love that movie. I'll probably be quoting it here and there throughout this uh, episode, even though it has nothing to do with Billy the Kid. Uh, quick thank you. For all the new subscriptions and iTunes reviews, man, lots and lots of listeners leaving reviews. It's so nice, man. Uh, makes me feel great. Makes me feel like uh, this is something you guys really appreciate. Makes me feel all all warm and fuzzy in my in my Western heart this week. Uh, the rise of Hitler in the Third Reich bonus episode is going to be coming up pretty quick. Uh, only need a uh, oh a few more reviews really to hit three hundred. So depending on you guys. Um, uh, you know, it could be this next Friday, the Friday after that. It's probably going to be the Friday after this next Friday, uh, just so I have time to to mention it on the next Monday podcast. You know, if it's cut and close, I don't want to just spring it on you again like the alien one. I want you to I want you to know it's coming. Also, working on the beginning of some Time Suck uh, merch, uh, Time Suck T-shirt. It looks dope. Very excited. Uh, I'm a big T-shirt guy. I've always liked graphic tees. Uh, for a long time. I, I, I wear these Ames Brothers t-shirts. God, I, man, maybe someday I can get an Ames Brothers Time Suck t-shirt. That'd be like a dream come true. They do these badass t-shirt designs, and, and, uh, and I like the kind of like the soft t-shirt, that, that, uh, and I like that kind of heathered look, so it's not just a flat color. And um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to get a Time Suck uh, t-shirt that I would really like to wear. So more on that, you know, down the road, but, it, but I just saw the first prototype, and oh, ha, very happy. I had a Time Suck Boner of joy. I don't know what other kind of boner you'd have. A boner of sadness would be. <laughs> that'd, be a, that'd be a scary boner. If you're like, oh, I got another sad, sadness boner. Ugh, you got some shit going on in your head. Okay. So, uh, yeah, hopefully I get that uh, coming up soon. Um, also, I had, I had an interesting week. I, I turned down some, some sponsorship, which is not easy to do, you know? <laughs> I would like to... Uh, you know, have this thing make some money eventually and, and reinvest in equipment and expand it and, uh, you know, all that fun stuff. But the company I was working with, uh, uh, considering working with, um, uh, uses Walmart. And uh, look, if you work for Walmart, I'm not going to rag on them a bunch. And, and know that uh, I am not against you. Actually, I am for you. I am for you being paid more by a company that makes uh, exorbitant wealth off your back. Billions and billions and billions <laughs> that they... Uh, Anyway, I'm not going to go down that wormhole again, but you, you know where I stand if you've listened to a lot of the podcasts. But anyway, I can't, I can't announce uh, uh, one company's business practices and then have that exact same company uh, sponsor the show. Uh, unless I wanted to change the name of this podcast to The King of Assholes. And as much as I do kind of like that name, uh, I don't want to be The King of the Assholes. At least not for that reason. Uh, I love this show. I really love it. It's, it's been the most rewarding creative project so far of, of the whole time I've been doing stand-up. I uh, love you guys and and, and, and respect you uh, trusting me uh, to kind of like, I don't know, you know, do my best with this kind of thing and make it the best it can be. And right now, that's that's not going to include being a hypocritical uh, a douche. Uh, fucking principles, man. Why do I have to have them? 
life would be so much easier if I didn't. And I have weird principles. Some people would have a lot of problems with my morality. You know, like, for example, I worked for the Playboy channel, a couple hundred shows, hosting with nude Playboy models on the show. Zero guilt over that. Zero guilt over that. Uh, do have guilt on working on Duck Dynasty. Because uh, to me, like, nude, nude pictures, you know, women uh, who, who love the female form, they love to uh, showcase their body. Uh, it's, it's very natural to me, you know? And I don't care if fucking dudes can do it, too. It's like all nudity is just not a big deal with me. It really isn't. I just look at it like, you know, in my opinion, we're, we're all just uh, uh, chimpanzees who can think a little better than a chimp. And, you know, we like having sex. It's a natural urge. We like seeing sexy things. That's never going to go away. When people get real prudish and try and, like, suppress that, I think it's just so, it's fucking ridiculous. It's never going to go away. And on the, and the female nudity specifically, you know, sometimes the, the feminism gets skewed over there, like, uh, how dare men just look at these naked pictures for the, for the purpose of pleasuring themselves. That, that's actually very natural. <laughs> and you can be a woman uh, who, who doesn't mind showcasing her body and also uh, very intelligent and, you know, and, and very uh, uh, into equality. They're not mutually exclusive. But that, that's what I think. A lot of people would not agree, but I've, I've I don't know, man. I've, I've uh, not really fit in with mainstream thinking my, my whole life. So that's me. But, uh, but uh, however, uh, helping some far-right kind of nuts convince the American people they're just some fucking good old boys working out of a warehouse in West Monroe, Louisiana, making some duck calls, even though they're millionaires. That, to me, is some manipulative uh, nonsense, and I, and I didn't like that. Uh, so, you know, I don't think that's going to happen again. I, you know what? I'm not, I think it won't happen again. I'm, I'm done with that, that phase of my life. Uh, I'd rather just get a straight job than do that again. So... Uh, don't get me wrong though. You know, I do want to make, uh, some money. I do like that. I am a capitalist, you know, deep down. I just want to do it the right way. That's what I'm really trying on this show. So thank you guys for listening and making that even a possibility for me. Thank you very, very much. And now, uh, uh, I have a new, a new little segment I'm excited about before we get into the Billy the Kid. Uh, I think you're going to like this. Uh, I have some, I have some flat earth theory updates, uh, that, you know, pe- people have written in and a little correction on a previous episode about the Nigerian emails. Uh, last week. So uh, time for some Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. Okay. All right. So this uh, this update comes in from uh, from Time Sucker, uh, Russell Clem. Uh, Russell, he's, he's updating my original estimate that it would cost the government $10 billion a year to have the NASA ice wall guards protect the world's citizens from falling off the Antarctica edge of our flat Earth and out into space. Uh, so again, if you if you haven't heard the flat Earth <laughs> uh, fuckery episode, basically some people who believe in a flat Earth also believe uh, some people believe that it's infinite, which is the most ridiculous to me. Like it just never ends. Earth never ends, which is so unbelievably ignorant. I just I am not even I am not even going to talk about that. That's so stupid. Uh, but then the other one that I believe most flat Earth theorists believe is that yeah, it's like this disc. The Earth is this disk, and on the edge of this disk is Antarctica. Like, think of like the center of the donut or the middle of the frisbee as uh, uh, the North Pole, and then the outer edge, the pie crust, if you will, is this Antarctic ice wall. And so, <laughs> some people uh, believe that NASA is guarding this this uh, this ice wall. So they want to keep people from falling out into space, and they want to keep people from realizing that the Earth is flat, from knowing the truth. Guys, they're suppressing the truth. So they can keep getting their sweet NASA money and, you know, f- fueling that into the illiterati or whatever fucking uh, Illuminati, excuse me. Uh, illiterati sounds kind of fun. Just like a, a group of powerful, illiterate people. The illiterati. They can't read, but they control your destiny. <laughs> the Illuminati. So anyway, uh, it's, it's some ridiculous stuff. And I speculated previously about, yeah, how much it would cost to have all these ice wall guards protect the earth. And I thought it'd be about $10 billion. And I thought the circumference, you know, was around like 45,000 miles around. Well, it turns out, uh, thanks to another time sucker, uh, you guys suck in the best way. Uh, Brandon Gramling, Brandon uh, pointed out that a guy who actually knows how to do equations, a guy with some skill with mathematics, that it's about 78,000 miles would be the circumference. Okay. So based on this, uh, uh, I'm going to read um, Russell's email here. He says, based on the added correction in your recent Houdini episode where the disc-shaped Earth is 48,000 miles at the edge, the Department of Defense recently released a statement that each deployed soldier costs $2.1 million to train, equip, feed, house, and man per year. With the bare-bones crew guarding each uh, base, it would take 72 guard soldiers. 
This is, and this is a guy with some you know military knowledge, so I, I was way off of my estimates. That's four eight-hour shifts with two soldiers on each corner, two sets of roving guards, two guards at the front and rear gates, and one NCO uh, officer to monitor. With the, <laughs> I, love how, I love how detailed this is, Russell. Yeah, oh, God. Um, uh, with the current tooth-to-tail ratio, combat soldiers to support at 10%, this equates to 70, 720 soldiers per base. With bases spread out every five miles, gives you 9,600 bases, 70, 720 soldiers per base times 9,600 bases gives you a force of 6,912,000 soldiers. <laughs> that's, a lot of, that's a lot of ice wall guards. Oh, so the number of soldiers plus the cost of soldiers deployed equals, uh, wow, uh, 14 trillion, uh, 515 billion, 200 million dollars per year. Not even Trump could hide that on his tax returns. Uh, but the biggest question this gave me is, how are we hiding this big of a budget, that many soldiers, and no one has leaked a thing? Well, okay, so Russell, uh, I'm going to add really quick, since you based the numbers on my incorrect calculation of 48,000 miles and not Brandon's 78,000 miles, we have to kick your number up by another 62.5%. Raising the new number uh, of the, the budget necessity from $14 trillion to $23 trillion, $587 billion, $200 million annually. And since the annual operating budget of the U.S. federal government is less than $4 trillion, uh, covering a, you know, $23.5 trillion ice well uh, seems a little bit, shall we say, fucking ridiculous. So if you believe a flat earth surrounded by an ice wall, you are preposterously ignorant. And yes, I'm talking to you, Kyrie Irving, uh, point guard for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I actually don't know if Kyrie believes in an ice wall, but I do know he's, he's gotten some heat lately, as well he should for believing in a flat earth, uh, which doesn't mean he's an idiot. I think everybody's throwing out like, wow, what a moron, this guy. He's not an idiot. He's just terribly misguided scientifically. He's obviously very intelligent in, in the sports, at the athletic intelligence, you know, kind of uh, arena, or he wouldn't be as good as he is at being a point guard where you got to think really quick and make a lot of quick decisions and make them well at his level to be, you know, uh, near MVP candidate caliber of play. But Jesus, man, when it, <laughs> when it comes to some basic science... He is a dummy. Um, so Russell uh, also had the, the end of his message. Uh, I'm going to say this too. I also wanted to push a shameless plug for veterans that are serving or have served honorably and ride a motorcycle to check out their local veterans motorcycle club. We are a nonprofit organization who supports veterans and their causes. For more information, please visit www.theveteransmc.com. F, uh, sorry, VFFV. And God bless our men and women who still put themselves in harm's way so I can listen to Dan bring me a little ear joy every Monday morning. Well, thanks, Russell. And, yeah, the veteransmc.com, the motorcycle club, that sounds very, very cool. Uh, yeah, thanks for the update and, the, and then the shout-out. One more quick little update. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the Nigerian email scam episode last week, I, I acted like garnered was not a correct word. I thought they meant gathered, and I made, I made fun of somebody for saying garnered instead of gathered. Well, time sucker Bob Bobson, not sure if that's a real name. I highly doubt it, but that's what shows up in the email. Uh, awesome, awesome fake name. Uh, even better, real real name if it is real. That'd be fantastic if your if your last name is Bobson and your parents chose to name you Bob on top of that. Well, again, I acted like the scammer should have said you know gathered, but garnered is is appropriate. It means, as Bob pointed out, to gather or collect. And I and I do know that because of Bob's email. Here's what here's what Bob said. The subject line uh, in Bob's email uh, said, "You're an idiot." And, the, and then the, the body says, Garnered is a word, beef float. With your subpar vocabulary, it's a surprise you haven't been the victim of a Nigerian scam. Love the podcast, Slow Stroke Forever. <laughs> I love that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Slow Stroke is a, is a reference to a bit of mine about this weirdo I saw at this Folsom Street Fair years ago uh, on the Hear This Album. Uh, I love you guys, man, keeping me informed and keeping me humble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bob Bobson. That was uh, fantastic, man. That, that, uh, that subject line, <laughs> you're an idiot. Uh, definitely got my attention. Uh, and that is it for this week's uh, Time Sucker Update. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. Okay, Billy the Kid. We're finally in it now. In a perfect world, Sam Elliott, circa 1998, would be narrating this episode, walking us through this tall tale, just like the stranger walked us through the world of the dude in The Big Lebowski. And to tell this tale right, he'd have to go back to the beginning. So, as often is the case, we're going to get historical. I finally accepted this is a historical podcast. Uh, you usually have to look back, you know, to properly understand even recent events. So, so let, us get, let us get back to the beginning. 
with a time suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Eighteen fifty nine. Henry McCarty, a.k.a. William Henry Bonney, a.k.a. Billy the Kid, a.k.a. Emilio Estevez in 1988's Young Guns, a.k.a. Val Kilmer in 1989's Gore Vidal's Billy the Kid, a.k.a. Chris Christopherson in 1973's Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, a.k.a. Paul Newman in 1958's The Left-Handed Gun, kind of a.k.a. Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future 3, wasn't necessarily Billy the Kid, but he did go back to Wild West Town in the late 1880s, a decade uh, in which Billy is killed, and he looked like someone about Billy's age, and he technically participates in a sneaky shootout. Anywho, uh, the real Billy the Kid is born in New York City on November 23rd, 1859. Maybe. You're going to hear a lot of maybes in this episode, because uh, that's all there is with a lot of the details of Billy's life. A lot uh, will forever remain unknown. And by the way, if you love Westerns, check out that Gore Vidal's Billy the Kid. I, I missed that one. Uh, didn't, didn't do, you know, uh, uh, didn't get a lot of exposure. It's like a TNT, I think, made for TV movie. But um, good traditional Western movie. Uh, a lot of the Billy the Kid fans say it's one of the most accurate depictions of the young outlaw. And it's Val Kilmer in his prime, man. When he was thin and, and not really weird and not making straight-to-video movies with 50 Cent. Uh, Tombstone, my favorite movie of all time, uh, would come out just five years later with Kilmer killing it as Doc Holliday. I'm your Huckleberry. But back to the real Billy. Uh, we know he was real, but no hospital records of his birth were ever found. Uh, it was a lot easier to be off the grid back in 1859. Social security numbers weren't a thing until November of 1936. Fingerprints weren't used in any capacity in America, let alone for criminal identification until 1882. Uh, 1903 is when the first criminal database using fingerprints was beginning to be established in the States. You know, back in 1859, a lot of moms just had babies. And if they weren't baptized or born in a hospital, you know, no record of their birth was ever created. Birth certificates didn't show up in America in any standardized, regulated way until an act of Congress in 1902. Uh, a uniform version agreed on by all states didn't show up until 1930. Babies, way less sacred back then. A lot of unmarked graves in the late 19th century. People died a lot, and no one got a Facebook tribute when they did. No one got a, a memorial tattoo. People just got tossed in a shallow, unmarked grave and forgotten about. Sad but true. However, historians agree uh, that Billy was born somewhere between 1859 and 1861. Most think he was born in New York City. Some historians say there was a baptism of a young Henry McCarty at the Church of St. Peter in New York again in 1859. But who gives a shit? He was a baby. He was a young whelp of a city slicker, not doing nothing know-how. Don't matter nothing if Billy was born in New York City or not because uh, as a baby, he didn't get any gunfights. All right, No baby gunfights for young Billy. Oh, man. He was a young gunfighter, but not that young. Kind of cool, though, if he would have been, right? You know, if it was like, young Billy got into his first gun battle at the tender age of 18 months. A precocious child, he'd learned to crawl at four months, walk at eight months, smoke some tobacco at 12 months, play tarot at 14 months at the casino, rustled cattle at 16 months, and drew down on another toddler in a milk saloon at the age of 18 months. The other baby, James Two Teeth Mahoney, drew first. But Billy Quick Draw the baby got the first and only shot off. Now that would be an article. Written by a lunatic. Uh, so, yeah, alas, he was just a baby and most likely just cried and shit himself a lot. Probably puked up on his mama's teat and got yelled out to be quiet. Well, let's go to the 1860s. 1860s. Uh, from the time he was born uh, until about 1870, there, there's virtually no definitive information about the kid's life. Some say his mother, Catherine McCarty, an Irish immigrant, moved to Indianapolis after Billy's father died. There's also the possibility that Billy was a bastard. That's right, a bastard. Billy the Bastard. Uh, his mom uh, probably wasn't married when he was conceived. Scandalous. Either way, she moves to Indiana at the age of 18, blew the boys away. It was more than they'd seen. Uh, wait, those are Tom Petty lyrics. Uh, but she did go to Indiana. Uh, she lived at 199 Northeast Street in Indianapolis, and it was there that she met Billy's step-pappy, William Antrim, a 23-year-old labor, laborer, teamster, and overall deadbeaten dickhead. More on him later. Uh, he lived in the neighborhood. And they started... Doing it, you guys. Yep, that's what I read in numerous a historical document. Catherine and William began to, quote, do it. Quote, often and hard. Quote, sweaty and a bit rough at times. Uh, of course, that didn't happen, uh, as far as me reading it. And then, okay, 1870. 1870, young Billy, Catherine, old Billy, and the fam, they moved to Wichita. Far from this opera forevermore, it's where they work the straw. 
making sweat drip out of every pore. Okay, that's a White Stripes song. But they did move to Wichita, according to the Wichita Eagle, a newspaper and not an information-giving bird of prey. How would that fucking... That'd be so cool if there was, like, some Wichita, like an actual bird. Just, e- Eagle! What What happened? What happened last week? Uh, I was, I was going to go caca. What bird does a caca? I'm an idiot. That's not an eagle. Well, hey, you know what? It's the Wichita Eagle. It's a speaking eagle. If it wants to go caca, caca, I'm an eagle! Oh, no, that's, nothing happened yesterday. Then, you know, that's what it does. That was the worst eagle impression that I don't, I don't know how you, anyone could do a great eagle impression verbally, but if, if I were to hear it, mine would pale in comparison to that. Mine was just like a weird, mine was more of like a weird dude, like a, uh, an insane dude wearing an eagle hat on the side of the road. Caca, I'm an, I'm an eagle! Who is whispering for some reason. All right, anyway, according to the Wichita Eagle, a newspaper and not an information giving bird of prey. Uh, Catherine McCarty was an enterprising business leader who was one of 124 people to sign a petition on July 21st, 1870 to incorporate the town of Wichita. She ran a downtown laundry, was the only woman to sign the document. So Billy, you know, he wasn't the only outlaw in the family. Wasn't the only pioneer, I guess. Um, but then consumption came along, just like Doc Holliday. Man, just like that longer Doc Holliday in, in Tombstone, Catherine got the consumption. And young Billy's uh, life was changed forever. Uh, consumption, also known as the White Plague, by the uh, beginning of the 19th century, it killed one in seven people. Uh, some historians estimate the so-called White Plague caused about 25% of all deaths in Massachusetts and New York during the 19th century. Victims suffering from, uh, or suffered from hacking, bloody coughs, debilitating pain in their lungs, fatigue. There was no cure, but doctors came to recognize that fresh air and outdoor living could change the course of the disease. You know, just let you live a little bit longer. And occasionally people did get it and uh, lived a long time. Uh, doctors advised patients to, to head away from the humidity of the Midwest, move to the more arid climate of Colorado or the Southwest, and that's what Catherine did. You know, doctors didn't know an awful lot back then, but they did know that humidity sucks. And boy, does it ever. Sometimes I daydream about retiring to, uh, to Florida. I do love going to Florida, uh, you know, sipping some Mai Tais on the beach. But then I don't know if I could handle, I don't know if I could handle the humidity. Man. I mean, I mean, I guess you have to have, if you have a pool, but whatever, but whew, it's like, it's like a wet blanket hitting your face. So she's getting out of that Midwest humidity, and, uh, and in 1873, Catherine and longtime boyfriend and do-it friend, William Atrum, head west first to Colorado, then to Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, where on uh, March 1st, 1873, they were wed, no longer living in sweaty carnal sin. After getting hitched, uh, the fam heads south to Silver City, New Mexico, in beautiful Grant County. Actually, I have no idea if Grant County, New Mexico is beautiful, but it sounds beautiful. You know, some, some old billboard on the side of an old wagon trail. Just head, to, head west to Grant County, New Mexico, where dreams are realized and fortunes are made. Silver City was uh, founded just a few years prior. After, wait for it, check this out, silver was discovered. Right? Who would have guessed it's silver? Oh. Uh, would have been funnier if something random like turquoise was discovered there. Right. So you've come to Silver City to open a mine claim, eh? eh what were you hoping to mine? <laughs> Why, silver, of course. Silver? There's, a, there's no silver around here. This, these hills are laden with turquoise. Just turquoise as far as the eye can see. Great big ores of turquoise. A lot of tacky jewelry money to be made here. Well, Catherine sets up her laundry business in Silver City. Uh, she may have uh, tuberculosis, but she also has a strong Irish immigrant work ethic. Bacon, selling cakes, pies, bread to miners on top of washing their clothes, taking on boarders as well. Uh, her and her husband, uh, Mr. Antrim, they own a small cabin on the corner of Main Street and Broadway. Ash Upson, co-author of Pat Garrett's biography, The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, uh, sorry, excuse me, the co-author with Pat Garrett of Billy the Kid's biography, The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, uh, wrote of her, to those who knew Billy, the kid's mother, his courteous, kindly, and benevolent spirit was no mystery. She was evidently of Irish descent. Her husband called her Kathleen. She was about medium height, straight and graceful in form, with regular features, light blue eyes, and luxuriant golden hair. She was not a beauty, but what the world calls a fine-looking woman. She kept borders in Silver City, and her charity and goodness of heart was proverbial. Many a hungry, tender foot has had cause to bless the fortune which led him to her door. In all her deportment, she exhibited the unmistakable characteristics of a lady, a lady by instinct in education. <laughs> Not a beauty. What, a, what the world calls a fine-looking woman. Man, that may be the kindest way I've ever heard someone called kind of ugly. 
So ugly mom or not, in 1873, things are going well for Billy, who's somewhere between 11 and 13 years old, depending on which source you choose to trust. Uh, His mom and his stepdad are making good living, uh, thanks entirely to his mom. They have a house to call home, while most Silver City residents are living in tents. Mom's TB seems to be doing okay. Uh, You know, even if she... uh, uh, even if it wasn't, I mean, you know, she, she shouldn't be working all these jobs. But anyway, Billy and his brother Joseph, or half-brother, uh, depending on the source, possibly a year or two older, possibly a year or two younger. Most sources believe two or three years younger. Uh, they're going to school. They're learning arithmetic and whatnot, eating mom's cakes and pies, jerking off in the family cabin when mom's not looking, dreaming of sneaking into one of Silver City's bordellos and losing their virginity to some corset and garter-wearing woman of the night, living the American dream. Life is good. And then... As it often happens, life is not good. 1874. By early 1874, mom's consumption has taken a turn for the worse, exacerbated by the fact that she's working about 14 goddamn jobs, uh, making enough money to compensate for her deadbeat husband, William, making next to nothing as a half-assed silver miner who gambles and drinks whatever little he does make. What a piece of shit. Man, the deadbeat husband-father uh, thing, that's, that's a character I've never understood. Like, I have my own faults, man, vices and sins for sure, but I would rather eat a bullet than just sit around getting drunk and pissing my money away, uh, just gambling uh, while my wife is working her ass off to keep a roof over our head. I I couldn't look her in the eye. Ah, William, you no good some bitch. Well, Catherine, she knew that William was a no good some bitch, and uh, and while she was dying and being the good woman and mom she was, she got her friend and neighbor Clara Truesdale to agree to look after her two sons after she passed away. Man, what strength is that? I cannot imagine having that conversation as a parent. Like, you know, if I'm wrong about being an atheist and heaven is real, oh, you can bet your sweet ass that Catherine is up there. Woman was a saint. Reminds me of my own mother-in-law, seriously. My, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a better woman than Joan Radzeminski. Saint Joan is what my wife and I call her. A wonderful Catholic woman. The best. Uh, well, on September 16, 1874, good woman or not, uh, uh, you know, fine-looking or not, Catherine uh, does die, and William isn't even home when she passes. Uh, the older William, uh, Billy's stepdad, doesn't even make the funeral. He's out in the hills prospecting, going to find that silver, going to make his fortune, going to be a sel- selfish, unsuccessful asshole. That's a tough combo, man, selfish and unsuccessful. Like, it's one thing to be sitting in your silver empire mansion, drinking some fine imported scotch, tearing up with the thought of missing your late wife's funeral. I think it's another thing to be sitting around a campfire, pouring moonshine into your toothless gullet, thinking, well, I reckon I could have showed up for old Katie after all. Uh, oh, well, the, the past is the past. Now, now hand me them beans before you clean that whole can out there, tugboat. Well, had Catherine lived, maybe Billy would have turned out to be a hardworking entrepreneur just like his mom was. Instead, after she dies, and his dirtbag stepdad takes off to Arizona, and he and his brother Joseph are separated. Clara can't, you know, can't take care of everybody. Doesn't have, doesn't have the means. Uh, Billy stays with Clara Truesdale and, and, and Joseph. Uh, he goes and works and, and lives at this gambling hall called the New Orleans Club in Silver City. Uh, growing up drinking, gambling, smoking a little Chinese opium from time to time. You know, just kid stuff. Turns into a career gambler. Uh, bounces back and forth between Silver City, Las Vegas. Uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico, that is. Uh, and Trinidad, Colorado, before eventually settling down in Denver, dying friendless and broke at the age of 66. Exactly how you don't want to die. Uh, outliving his brother, though, by threefold. Now, Billy initially did well as a kid. He's working at the Silver City Hotel. He's washing dishes. He's waiting tables at the restaurant. He, for some reason, he wasn't able to live with the Truesdale family very long. Um, not sure if that was uh, you know, his choice or theirs, but he did all right. He, he lived at a boarding house. He's paying his way with money from the hotel. He's well-liked by his school teachers and his boss, but without proper you know, adult supervision, uh, he gets into some trouble, as kids do. 1875. Now, this is Billy's first arrest. Billy gets arrested for stealing several pounds of butter from a local rancher and selling it to a local shop owner. Gonna, ma- gonna make that butter money, making that sweet butter cheddar as a butter baron. If that isn't a dumb kid's crime, I don't know what is, man. You know, just, it's perfect. I'll steal butter from the rancher, uh, just a couple pounds at a time, so they don't even notice. Uh, I'll sell it to George the Mercantile, and, I, and I'll make 100% profit. And I'll do it every week until I have enough money to buy my, my very own butter ranch. You know, and then you do, and then you do it one time, and the store owner's like, "Wait, hey kid, where would you get this butter anyway?" Uh, well, I got it from my butter horse. <laughs> you know that butter comes from cows, right? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. My, my my butter cow is named Horse. Uh, I gotta go. Pew! Just d- disappears in a puff of smoke. You know, then a rancher comes in, complains about some some missing butter, and you're arrested for being a teenage dipshit. 
Well, uh, all Billy got for that first arrest was a tongue lashing from the local sheriff. Uh, but the next time, he wasn't so lucky. He's now befriended uh, a local hooligan who went by the nickname Sombrero Jack. And Sombrero Jack was up to no good. Uh, of course he was. He's called Sombrero Jack. Let that be a lesson any kids listening to this podcast. Uh, if you meet an adult who wants to be your friend and has a na- nickname like Sombrero Jack or Belt Buckle Bernard or, you know, Moose Knuckle Tony, run away. No one ever writes in their mem- memoirs, uh, life was looking bleak until the day I ran into Moose Knuckle Tony. That's, that's when things took a turn for the good. No, uh-uh. September 23, 1875, Billy is arrested for stealing a bundle of stolen clothes from a Chinese laundromat. Uh, Sombrero Jack had actually stolen them, but the, he let the kid wear some of the clothes if Billy was going to be cool for taking the fall if he got caught. And he did get caught, and he gets thrown in jail. The local sheriff, Sheriff Whitehill, same guy who uh, lectured him earlier. What a great name for a Wild West sheriff, by the way. Sheriff Whitehill. Uh, you know, he still has a soft spot for Billy, and even though he puts him in the jail to uh, uh, await his trial, he kind of lets him have run of the little jail. He doesn't, doesn't leave him in his cell. He lets him kind of hang around in the, in the actual jail building unsupervised. Billy takes advantage of that favor, and after only two days of being there, he sneaks out by climbing his skinny ass into the fireplace and sneaking up the chimney, jumping off the roof, and fleeing. Okay? So now Billy heads to the Truesdale family, and they give him enough money. Uh, he's the, only, the only friends he has in the area, really, like, you know, longtime friends. They give him enough money to flee to Arizona, go find his stepdad, William. And uh, so, you know, they're looking out for him, even if he's not living with him. Good old, good old Truesdales. Well, Billy finds his dad, uh, stepdad in Clifton, Arizona, uh, who reportedly told him, well, if that's the kind of boy you are, get out. Wow. Mm-hmm. No surprise there. We, are, we already knew William was a piece of shit. So now it's 1875. Billy's alone in the Wild West. Not a good place for a kid to be, man. This is a largely lawless land full of stabbings and shootouts, hard people living hard lives. The U.S. Army is currently at war in the area with Geronimo and the Apaches. I mean, these are the days when you could still die from getting an Indian arrow. You know, you could get scalped. That shit actually still happens. You know, there's rattlesnakes, there's tumbleweeds, unforgiving desert sun. Young Billy, you know, he's, he's a sl- of a slender build and a girlish look. He's alone. Mom and dad are dead. His stepdad's a piece of crap. And uh, while he's not a top police priority, you know, he's technically a fugitive. Well, 1876. 1876, not physically capable of a man's work due to his youth and build, Billy eventually falls in with a man named John Mackey, and the two of them start stealing saddles and horses, especially from the Army around Camp Grant, Grant Arizona, in 1876. Uh, I guess it was from Mackey that Billy would get his nickname, The Kid. And, I mean, he literally is a kid at this point, especially. And in 1876, uh, Billy would also kill his first man, a man with another nickname. Everybody seemed to have nicknames back then. Sombrero Jack, Billy the Kid, and now a blacksmith named named Frank Windy Cahill. Oh, Windy! What a terrible nickname. Just sounds like you're a dude who farts a lot. Oh, open the windows, boys! Oh, oh Windy Cahill's are heading this way. <laughs> Leave the door open. Windy Cahill, he's, he's coming on in. Uh, apparently, uh, Windy's nickname should have been Dickhead, because I, I guess he acted like one. Uh, Gus Gildea, who was working as a, as a ranch hand around Fort Grant at this time, he recalled the kid having a lot of trouble with Cahill. Uh, shortly after the kid came to Fort Grant, this is a quote from him, uh, quote, shortly after the kid came to Fort Grant, Windy started abusing him. He would throw Billy to the floor, ruffle his hair, slap his face, and humiliate him before the men in the saloon. End quote. So, and Wendy was a big man, and, and Billy wasn't. Uh, you know, Billy, uh, full grown, uh, you know, l- later in life, was about 5'7 and about a buck 35 soaking wet. So at this time, you know, he, maybe he's, you know, not even that, 5'4, five, 5'5, five, five, you know, 100 pounds, and he's got this, he's got this dickhead, big old meaty, windy, windy, meaty Cahill wrestling him, wrestling him to the ground and humiliating him. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't put up with uh, uh, Wendy's shit. We're going to find as, as we get farther into Billy. He doesn't really put up with anybody's shit. Um, August 18, 1877, the kid has had enough of Wendy's abuse. He's had a run-in with his tormentor at Atkins Cantina. Cahill called the kid a pimp. The kid returned the insult by calling him a son of a bitch. And it's on in this corner. We have Billy the kid in this corner. Wendy. Blown out pair of underwear, Cahill. Well, Cahill plows the kid, wrestles him to the ground. Gildea recalled, quote, Wendy threw the youth to the floor, sat on him, pinned his arms down with his knees, and started slapping his face. Billy worked his right arm free, managed to grasp his forty-five. Then there was a deafening roar. 
Wendy slumped to his side as the kid squirmed free. End quote. Well, after the kid shot Cahill, uh, mortally in the stomach, man, gut shot no less, uh, he bolted out the door, mounted the nearest horse, skinned on out of town. Uh, despite the previous abuse and Cahill being much larger and getting the upper hand in the fight, the shooting was still considered unjustifiable, and Billy was captured by some local soldiers uh, from the local camp there, the local fort. Well, these, these, these guards, you know, they take pity on the kid, and he's basically allowed to escape. This is the second time in his young life Billy's escaped trial, and it won't be the last. And it also shows that he must have been, you know, he wasn't like some, some outlaw villain. He was very well liked all throughout his young life. People liked this guy. Uh, so he must have been, you know, very charismatic. And, uh, and, and, and <laughs> this won't be the last, yeah, like I said, last time he escapes trial, uh, he has a big bloody highlight escape scene from like a future Hollywood blockbuster coming up. Um, it's going to be very excited to tell that part of the story. So now the kid is wanted for murder. He makes his way back to New Mexico. He, he, he's going to be dead in four years, but man, what a legendary four years he's going to live. Uh, he's going to live more in those four years than most do in 90. And so even though, you know, we're still going to kind of go in chronological order for the rest of today, uh, timeline just doesn't feel right anymore. This next four years is going to take some twists and turns, going to expand too much, too many side roads. All right? All right, partner? So let's, let's hop along out of this here mess. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. So now, Billy is on the run for murder. Uh, Billy next turns up in the house of High School Jones... It's kind of a weird name, H-E-I-S-K-E-L-L, Haskell Jones, in Pecos Valley, New Mexico. Uh, Apaches, remember I brought them up earlier, they'd stolen the kid's horse, left him uh, no choice but to walk uh, many miles to the nearest settlement, which was Mrs. Jones' house. How crazy is that, man? He's on the run in the days when you can get killed by Apaches. This is all happening in the heart of the Wild West, and Mrs. Jones nurses the young Billy, who is near death, back to health. And then because her name is Mrs. Jones, I also imagine her having a torrid love affair with the young William, learning him in the uninhibited ways of the lonely, love-starved frontiers woman. For the record, there's no mention of that anywhere, and she's probably a happily married, maternal, God-fearing homesteader who never gave him a single seductive glance, but I'm going to ludicrously assume Billy got busy in the Pecos Valley nonetheless, because that's what would happen in the movie, and this all feels very cinematic to me. Uh, the Jones family did develop a strong attachment to Billy. Gave him one of their horses. Again, shows the kids must have been a fairly likable dude. There's always someone willing to help him out. Well, Billy, after leaving the Joneses, uh, you know, he can't get taken care of by Mrs. Robinson forever. He's got to make some money. And so around this time, he, he, he re begins to refer to himself as William H. Bonney instead of Henry William McCarty, probably to try and conceal his wanted identity. I mean, you know, he's not just wanted for uh, a little thievery now. He's killed a guy. Uh, he would also, you know, sometimes refer to himself as Billy Antrim, take his stepdad's last name. Uh, but McCarty, Bonnie, or Antrim, he, he's, again, he's wanted for murder. Honest work is going to be a little hard to come by, and he ends up falling in with the boys' cattle rustling gang, led by another outlaw, Jesse Evans. Now, quick note about cattle rustling. Super common in the 1870s Southwest, right? It was huge in the Pecos Valley in Lincoln County, New Mexico. At the time, the largest county in the entire country, uh, and it had like one sheriff. Uh, this huge, huge county. 1866, Charles Goodnight, Oliver Loving, had driven vast herds of cattle along the Pecos and set up cow camps in Seven Rivers, what is now Carlsbad. Uh, Texas cattle baron John Chisholm soon joined them, brought an estimated 100,000 head of cattle of his own to the Pecos Valley, earning him the nickname King of the Pecos Valley. And that's a lot of beef. Hard to keep an eye on it all. And with again, with very few lawmen around, it was easy pickings for, for cattle rustlers. Uh, Chisholm, by the way, for, for cinema buffs, uh, was portrayed by John Wayne, the Duke, in a 1970 movie called Chisholm. All right, very direct. Uh, in, your, in the early 1870s, two dudes, Lawrence Murphy and James Dolan, uh, they opened up the only store in all of Lincoln County, this gigantic county near Fort Stanton. Murphy and Dolan, mercantile and banking, soon bringing another powerful businessman, John Riley, of the air into the fold. And these Irish guys... Uh, have this little, uh, the only business in town, and again, the county was huge. At the time, it covered a fifth of the entire New Mexico territory. And in addition to the store, these guys also owned huge cattle herds, big cattle ranches. And so uh, these guys were able to obtain lucrative government contracts with the military at Fort Stanton. So now they have a monopoly. Uh, hopefully some of you uh, remember my attitudes towards monopolies uh, from the Walmart episode. Not a big fan. These assholes own the cattle and the only store that sells the cattle uh, for many, many miles around. They control pricing on the meat they both raise and sell on the rest of the goods. 
uh, as well. They virtually control the entire local economy of this county. And the local law enforcement is in their pocket as well. And together with their allies, they formed a business association, really gang, called The House. And The House runs Lincoln County like Brad Wesley runs the town of Jasper in the 19, uh, 1989 classic movie, Swayze, uh, a Swayze movie, Roadhouse. All right? This is Roadhouse. Fucking The House is Brad Wesley and, and his little associates. It's their town. And soon Billy the Kid will be Swayze's Dalton, undersized and underestimated Again, Billy the Kid was only about 5'7", buck 35, but he was quick as he was quick with a gun, just like Swayze was, was quick with a throat rip, and he'll help a new store owner, just like Swayze helped the dude trying to clean up the bar and roadhouse. Okay, so the house is not well liked by locals for obvious reasons. They charge too much for their goods, pay too little for, for locals' uh, cattle, but no one is able to stand up to them until lawyer Alexander McSween and cyborg John Tunstall set up a rival business. Tunstall, check this out, half-robot killing machine sent back from the future to free the people of Lincoln County. Okay, that's obviously not true. A little bit of Terminator got into my brain for some reason. How cool would that be, though, if it was? Right? A little sci-fi mixed into this Western? Get a little Westworld with it? No. Tunstall is a young, wealthy English banker who's decided to try and make his fortune uh, in the New Mexico cattle business. You know, he had moved to Victoria, British Columbia, to work at a store his father had there, had some money to invest, wanted to strike out on his own, Heard about people pouring into Lincoln County, New Mexico, and there was a lot of money to be potentially made. So he arrives in Santa Fe, meets this lawyer, McSween. McSween informs him that the house runs the only game in town, but that there are uh, is excuse me another regional cattle baron who would like to expand his business from the Pecos Valley into Lincoln. And that's the king of the Pecos Valley, John Chisholm, right? John Wayne. Uh, Tunstall meets Chisholm, uh, again, owner of more than 100,000 head of cattle, and Chisholm decides to back J.H. Hunstall and Co. Shop and Bank, located near and in direct competition with Murphy and Dolan Mercantile and Banking. So now the seeds of the Lincoln County War. This is a big Wild West to-do, uh, a battle where Billy the Kid would achieve most of his notoriety. Now they've been sown. Tunstall, Chisholm, and McSween, and soon to be Billy, versus the House. And just like with gambling, initially the odds favored the house to win. Man, they had local sheriff William Brady on their side. They had territorial governor uh, in their pocket, uh, other politicians in their pocket. And when Tunstall refuses to cave into local law and political pressure to just go away and let them run their county, you know, let Brad Wesley have his town, uh, violence is threatened. And the young John Tunstall uh, hires some local tough guys to both protect himself, his investment, and help work his ranch. And uh, Billy the Kid's one of these men. Uh, he, one of the boys' gang who had previously stolen cattle from both Tunstall and from the house. Now, Billy had just been put in the, into jail uh, in the town of Lincoln. It's, it, I say town. It was like unincorporated. We can call it a town. It wasn't officially a town. But he's in the little Lincoln County jail for, for stealing a team of buggy horses from none other than John Tunstall. Uh, but John ha- has him released on the condition that he'll work for him. He'll put Billy on the payroll as a cowboy gunslinger attached to a team of other young you know, men, basically the, the plot of young guns, the movie with Emilio Estevez. And it is said that uh, Billy was delighted by this opportunity to go straight. He respected Tunstall because Tunstall treated him with respect. Again, how charismatic must have Billy win? Billy Ben, excuse me. He, he just uh, talked the man he had just stolen from into hiring him. And how crazy was the Old West where men like those in the house could just run shit the way they saw fit, could just run a county? Well, after seeing Tunstall hire, hire Billy and a few other kind of you know local uh, tough guys, the House decides to further arm themselves. They hire other boys' gang members uh, Billy used to ride with, including Jesse uh, Hefferfucker Evans, mm-hmm, the gang leader. Jesse had recently acquired this new, more aggressive nickname in a drunken, romantic encounter witnessed by none other than Willie Steerdick Whisper McJenkins in 1876. And Hefferfucker is ready for war. Okay, that nickname stuff was bullshit, but you know that. But Jesse and a few other cattle rustlers really are now working with the house, and Billy and a few other rustlers are really working with Tunstall. Billy loved Tunstall, you know, claiming he was the only man that ever treated me like I was freeborn and white. All right, so that, that love's going to come into play later. And again, I say love, like loves him like a, a, a father figure, even though he was about the same age. That This doesn't get into any uh, homoerotic territory. Okay, so now let's get into the Lincoln County War. Billy has stumbled into a very volatile situation. He's working as a cattle hand slash hired gunslinger for Tunstall, a man uh, very much wanted dead by the house. His official title is cattle guard, but it's Tunstall he's really hired to protect. And then in February 1878, shit hits the proverbial fan. 
Dolan and his house associates are losing lots of money to Tunstall's new store and bank. The house is super pissed at Tunstall's lawyer and business partner, McSween. Uh, McSween is the executor of a will of a recently departed, uh, the will of a recently departed house associate, Emil Fritz, a man who Dolan and Murphy, members of the house, had a 100000 life insurance claim on. And now McSween won't sign off on paying the house the $100,000, money they need to stay afloat in this new competitive financial atmosphere. House members go to court, and the court ends up siding with the house. Of course they do. They're probably in, the, in their pocket. And the house uh, uh, holds McSween, or excuse me, the court holds McSween accountable for owing Dolan and Murphy the money. Well, McSween, McSween still won't pay. So now the court authorizes them to seize some of McSween's assets, and those assets include goods from the store he shares with Tunstall and also ranch assets he shares with Tunstall. All a bunch of trumped-up bullshit. But what it leads to is Sheriff Brady forming a posse, deputizing a bunch of local tough guys, and this whole posse heads to Tunstall's ranch to seize some of his assets. When Tunstall protests the legality of Brady bringing this posse onto his land, one of these new deputies, William Morton, uh, feels, you know, feels like there's fucking a million Williams in this story. Well, this William, William Morton, he gives Tunstall a bullet in the head, and shit is on. The war has begun. Woo, doggy! Oh, you done start shit now, William Morton. You peeled open a big old can of worms. Oh, you don't even know how many worms hide in that can. So now Billy, uh, he, remember, he adored this Tunstall guy, and now this guy's dead, and he's not happy about it. After Tunstall's funeral, Billy swore, quote, I'll get every son of a bitch who helped kill John if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> a showdown's a coming. Why, Johnny Ringo, you look like someone just walked on over your grave. Well, Billy has to wait a bit on revenge. The kid, along with Fred Waite, are briefly jailed by Sheriff William Brady on some bullshit nothing charges to keep a war from breaking out. But he doesn't stop it. All Brady does is delay it. After he's released, Billy soon joins a posse led by Dick Brewer. That's a real name. Dick Brewer. It's a Dick Brewer. He's brewing up some dick. And uh, he's Tunstall's ranch foreman. A group of cattle guards uh, and other people who finally had enough of the house. And they all called themselves the regulators. Mount up. My brain automatically says that every time I hear the word regulator. Mount up. And initially, the group's uh, primary aim was to hunt for Tunstall's killer, William Morton. So now the regulators mount up are coming for Morton. I'm going to stop saying that after that word. Um, on March 6, 1878, the regulators have tracked Morton. I still said that in my head, uh, the, the mount up part. They've tracked Morton in the countryside near Rio Pen Penasco. After a five-mile running gunfight, Morton surrenders on the condition that he and his fellow deputy sheriff, Frank Baker, would be returned alive to Lincoln. However, on the third day of the journey back to Lincoln, March 9th, Billy and another regulator kill these guys along uh, with another fe fellow regulator that tried to stop him from killing him. Man, remember, he swore he'd get you, and that's what he did. He's going to get you. He's, he's going to get you. And about uh, and talk about how cool is that five-mile running gun battle. That's like straight out of a Western, man. Horses galloping across a prairie, shooting across the saddle, cowboys hunkered down, making themselves as small as possible to avoid the gunfire behind them. I'm hearing just a lot of, yeah, yeah, come on, Silver. C come on, Secretariat. Uh, come on, Mama's Teacup. Man, you are shit out of luck if you're riding on the back of Mama's teacup in a firefight. I mean, you were already embarrassed to have that as a horse, but she was cheap. You didn't have a lot of scratch to spend on horses. She's always been slow and undersized, but now Mama's teacup is going to get you killed. Well, the regulators, uh, they're not near through. Not by damn sight. Three weeks later, Billy and several other regulators hole up in Tunstall's store while Sheriff William Brady searching for the killers of his deputies. They ambushed the sheriff and his men on April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1878, killing Sheriff Brady, mortally wounding one of his deputies, shooting from behind a 10-foot adobe wall outside the Worley Hotel in Lincoln, New Mexico. The concealed gunmen mow down Brady and Deputy Hinman. The sheriff gets hit by a dozen bullets, sitting in the middle of the road, still not dead, he groans, oh Lord, tries to rise, another volley of shots riddles his corpse. He falls over, he's dead. Deputy Hinman moans and cries out for water. Ike Stockton emerges from his saloon, rushes down the street, attempts to pull the wounded deputy to safety, and as he does, Hinman is hit again himself and dies in the street. And now the kid is in a whole heap of trouble. He's killed a sheriff. Ain't no law around here, law dog. Ain't no law around here. Probably killed a sheriff. Uh, uh, probably, I don't say killed a sheriff, because some historians think it could have been another regulator whose bullet actually killed Brady, but whatever, Billy's who gets blamed for it. So now Billy's hiding out in Lincoln County, still working for Tunstall's party McSween, 
uh, his partner, McSween, who was able to hide him from what few authorities came looking for him. It was easier to evade the law back then. The war continues. But then McSween himself is shot dead. On July 19, 1878, McSween and his supporters, including Billy the Kid, are besieged by the new sheriff, George Pepin. Sheriff Pepin and a group of uh, Pepin's men at McSween's home. McSween's house is set on fire, and several people are shot dead as they flee out of the burning house, including McSween himself. Damn it! He had a place to hide, and now that place is burnt. Dag nabbit. Well, shit has gotten so out of hand in Lincoln County, the president himself now intervenes. In September 1878, President Rutherford B. Hayes removes New Mexico's corrupt uh, territorial governor, Governor Axtell, and appoints Lew Wallace in his place. And then on November 13th, 1878, Governor Wallace proclaims amnesty for all those involved in the Lincoln County War if they were not already under uh, an indictment. Well, this proclamation does not include Billy the Kid because he is under indictment for killing Sheriff Brady. So instead of getting amnesty, he gets a $500 reward put on his head, uh, which is a little over eleven grand in today's dollars. Not a crazy amount, but enough to get people looking for him. Man, the fucking house, man. The house always wins. They're back in charge now. Tunstall and McSween's cattle empire, their brief competition is gone. Well, Billy, tired of living on the lamb, uh, he gets a message to this new Governor Wallace that he'll abide by the new peace agreement if amnesty will be given to him as well. Says he has no interest in fighting anymore, and then the governor makes him a deal. Gets word to Billy that he'll give him amnesty, a full pardon, as long as Billy will testify against others for the various crimes of the Lincoln War. And Billy agrees. And he agrees uh, because he really is sick of the violence because his old boy's gang friend, outlaw Jesse Evans, who some historians believe was far deadlier than Billy himself, had recently killed the attorney McSween's, uh, the attorney McSween's widow had hired to go after the house for McSween's murder, a guy named Houston Chapman. On February 18, 1879, Billy, with some others, rode into Lincoln, hoping to parlay with Dolan and his group. One of the Dolan group wanted to shoot Billy. Instead, the two sides gathered on the road to shake hands and sign an agreement not to testify against anyone. It was decided that anyone who broke the agreement should be killed on sight. This agreement was celebrated by everybody getting drunk, except for Billy. Uh, the drunks demanded that one of those on Billy's side, Houston Chapman, do a little jig. Just dance a little jig for me, all right? You dance a little jig. Well, Houston refuses, and then Dolan and another, they fire their guns and they kill him and then set him on fire and force Billy to watch. Not a subtle, subtle message that, you know, you better not, you better not actually testify you know, with, the gov- with the governor against this. We don't give a shit about your amnesty. Well, Billy does testify. In March of 1879, he testifies in front of a Lincoln grand jury. His testimony leads to the arrest of more than 50 men for the murders and crimes related to the Lincoln County War. Dolan himself, leader of the House, is indicted on his involvement in the murder of Houston Chapman. He hired Jesse Evans to do it. Jesse himself takes off, flees, eventually captured by Texas Rangers and imprisoned. Uh, However, uh, Billy himself is not given the promised pardon. And then shortly after testifying and being double-crossed by Governor Dickbag Wallace, uh, he slips his handcuffs and escapes, spending the next year or so of of his short life hiding around Fort Sumner and the Pecos River Valley. So now Billy really is an outlaw. He's not just wanted for murder. He is wanted for the murder of a lawman. He's testified against a number of other bad men who also want him dead. Not in a good spot, and he's a little pissed off that everyone was given amnesty but him. Uh, he's, he's getting by, rustling some cattle with a new gang that includes some former regulators, a group that simply called themselves the Rustlers. Governor Wallace has put out wanted ads in the papers uh, all over the Southwest, including Santa Fe and Vegas, making sure everybody knows about this $500 price on his head. Well, on January 10th, 1880, uh, Joe Grant uh, looks like he tries to collect on that $500, and it doesn't work out well for him. Billy's having a drink in Bob Hargrove's saloon in Fort Sumner, with James Chisholm, brother of Tunstall Ranch backer John Chisholm, and some other cowboys. Wanted as he is, he's still enough of a badass to pop into the saloon and grab some drinks. It was a different era, man. Dude had some balls, too. Well, a newcomer to that area, uh, area, Joe Grant, a.k.a. Texas Red, recognizes the kid, walks up to him and says, I'll kill a man quicker than you will for a whiskey. Apparently, he's looking to make a reputation as a local badass and become uh, some kind of Wild West legend himself. Well, the kid says back to him, uh, That's a beauty, Joe, referring to Joe's revolver. The kid then takes the pistol from Grant's hand, spins the cylinder, checking at the same time to see how much ammunition contains, three cartridges instead of the full six, purposely moves the cylinder so that the next load will be a failure, returns the revolver to Grant. He knew this guy obviously is looking for some trouble. Short time later, Texas Red threatens to kill Baron, uh, cattle Baron John Chisholm, not realizing it's not John, it's his brother James. Billy tells him to go look for trouble, trouble, yeah, trouble somewhere else. Joe aims his pistol on the real target he had that evening, Billy himself. Billy turns his back to Joe to continue drinking. Uh, Joe pulls the trigger. Billy hears the click of the empty chamber because he's a goddamn Wild West Batman. 
and he spins around and lickety split puts a bullet right through Texas Red's brains. Billy then walks over to the fresh corpse, looks down at it and says, Joe, I've been there too often for you. Cool as a cucumber, that Billy was. Kills a man and throws out some, some slick phrasings over his recently uh, died corpse. Wow, man. What a, what a, how fucking crazy is that, man? Just how smooth is that? She's like, this guy might be some trouble. I'm going to take a couple bullets out of his gun. In case he tries to shoot me, I'll have a little jump on him. So, okay, so even though Tex killing Texas Red doesn't bring him any additional heat from local lawmen, things are heating up. After Billy's escape in 1879, a former friend of his, Pat Garrett, is elected sheriff in 1880, and he vows to bring Billy to justice, even getting permission from the U.S. Marshals to chase Billy across state and territory lines if necessary. All right, well, Sheriff Grant, uh, Garrett uh, gets in numerous gun battles with Billy and his rustlers over the next year. One of his deputies, James Carlisle, getting killed in one of these exchanges. Billy's blamed for that murder as well. You know, now, at least according to Sheriff Garrett, he's killed, you know, two lawmen. Well, finally, Garrett's posse tracks the rustlers to their hideout in Stinky Springs, surrounds them. Inside were Billy and four of the rustlers. The siege continues until the next day when one of the rustlers finally waves a white flag and the bandits surrender after one of them is shot and killed. And then Billy and the kid as his gang are captured on December 23, 1880 and taken to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I love that. Stinky Springs! That's a perfect Wild West hideout. So now he's sentenced to die. April 9, 1881, after a one-day trial, Billy the Kid is sentenced to hang for the murder of Sheriff Brady in order to be transferred to the Lincoln County Courthouse. Now, legend says that upon the sentencing, check this shit out, the judge told Billy he was going to hang until he was, quote, dead, dead, dead. And then Billy responds with, well, you can go to hell, hell, hell. Woo that is some Wild West shit right there, you guys. So it's bad news for Billy, but good news for us. Because then he goes on to have one of the most badass, if not the most badass jailbreak in Wild West history. Thursday, April 28, 1881. Billy waits to be hung while the new Lincoln County Sheriff, Pat Garrett, one-time friend of Billy, more on that relationship later, he travels to nearby White Oaks, New Mexico, to buy supplies, build the gallows to hang Billy with. While the sheriff is away, Billy asks Deputy James Bell to use the outhouse. He's gotten along with Bell, all right, the past few weeks. They've even played cars together in the jail for the past time. I mean, death row was very different back then. These guys all knew each other. Both Bell and the only other deputy on duty, uh, Pecos Bob Ollinger, you know, they were around for the Lincoln County War. Pecos Bob even fought in that war, fighting for the house, actually killed one of Billy's friends, John Jones. Pecos Bob uh, apparently has been taunting Billy, daring him to try to escape so he can use a new shotgun they have in the armory on Billy. Well, Pecos Bob... He takes the, uh, the other five prisoners staying at the Lincoln County Jail and courthouse to a local hotel for dinner. Billy is deemed too dangerous to be let out, and he's left behind. Again, the penal system of the New Mexican Wild West is clearly in its infancy. They don't have an actual prison with proper cells and dedicated staff. They just have a two-story courthouse with a few cells in the middle of a very rural area in the unincorporated town of Lincoln. And they have a couple, you know, former fucking cattle rustlers or cowboys or whatever <laughs> working as deputies. Uh, well, Deputy Bell, uh, he puts Billy in some shackles, takes him to the privy behind the courthouse. Not even an indoor toilet in the courthouse, man. This is rural. Billy does his best Houdini impression in the bathroom, slips, out, uh, slips a wrist out of one of his handcuffs. And then as he and Bell step back inside the courthouse, slugs that dude in the face and either shoots Bell with his own gun that he's just taken from him or a pistol a friend may have hit in the outhouse. The exact detail is lost to history. So much for his poker buddy. Guess maybe they weren't that close after all. And now check out what he does. I love this. Because he already has a pistol. He doesn't need to do this, but he clearly has a flair for the dramatic. This is the kind of thing that really made Billy the Kid a Wild West legend. Billy goes upstairs, grabs the shotgun Deputy Ollinger had been taunting him with from the second story armory, and he waits for Ollinger to return, where he's you know, taking the other prisoners across the street for dinner, or for lunch, excuse me. And so the man who's been taunting him, the man who killed his friend, old regulator buddy, John Jones, he returns to the courthouse, Knowing he's heard the shot, you know, he's heard the shot that fired, uh, that killed Bell. Well, now Billy is perched under a window facing the court side yard. He can see Pecos Bob running back to the courthouse. Here's Pecos Bob yell, did, did Bell just kill the kid? Godfrey Goss, a former cook on the Tunstall Ranch, who had been grabbing vegetables from a garden behind the courthouse, had just seen Bell stumble from the courthouse moments before, dropping dead from a bullet wound. And he answers him, he says, the kid has killed Bell. And then just like out of a damn movie, Smiling Billy pops up in the second story window, shotgun aimed at Ollinger's face and says, hello, Bob. And Bob says, yes, and he's killed me too, 
right before taking a whole mess of buckshot to his obliterated face. Ooh, boy. Woo, that's how you make an escape. Hot damn. Well, a crowd is now gathered over the gunfire, and Billy addresses them from the courthouse. He tells him he doesn't want to kill anybody else, but he will if he has to. He gathers a Winchester rifle, two pistols, a whole bunch of ammo from the armory, tells his old uh, friend, you know, Tunstall Ranch uh, guy, Godfrey, to gather him some tools to get the shackles off, get him some food, and get him a horse. Godfrey obliges. About an hour later, after getting his shackles off enough to ride, he gallops out of town, a legend of the Wild West. Man, unreal. Sounds so cinematic, it's hard to believe. Kills both deputies, the only lawman on duty in town, broad daylight, frees himself from shackles in front of the, uh, the damn near the whole town, and then rides off on a stolen horse, taking the sheriff's rifle and two pistols with him. That alone makes this entire time suck worth it for me. All right. So now Billy's on the run. He's back on the run. Sheriff Garrett, back on the chase. Uh, Billy's now killed, or at least Garrett believes he's killed at least four lawmen. He has lost interest in capturing him alive after Billy's numerous escapes. Governor Wallace has renewed the $500 reward. You'd think he'd raise it, but whatever. Uh, a few months after his escape, on the night of July 14th, the sheriff and his two deputies approach the, uh, uh, the dusty old fort, now converted to a living quarters, and um, Fort Sumner. And the residents were sympathetic to the kid there, and the lawmen knew that. They knew they could extract, you know, not a lot of information. But Garrett thought he maybe could get some info out of an old friend uh, that he and Billy shared, a guy named Peter Maxwell. And so he goes to, to Peter Maxwell's uh, house, to, or little apartment, to talk to him. Before we get into that uh, a little further, the last moments of Billy's life, let's delve into his relationship with, with Sheriff Garrett. Because Pat Garrett and Billy have a lot of history before uh, uh, Garrett became sheriff. Pat Garrett, born in 1850, nine years before the kid, down in Chambers County, Alabama. Dad moved his family to Louisiana to work on a plantation. Didn't go well. By Pat's uh, teenage years, the family's in debt. And like Billy, soon uh, after that, both his parents are dead. Young Pat moved out west to make his fortune, first arriving in Dallas County, making his way as a buffalo hunter back when that was still a thing. Uh, also, like uh, Billy, as a young man, he killed a dude, shooting fellow buffalo hunter Joe Briscoe dead after a heated argument. Never charged for the crime because back then you could shoot somebody for an argument, and it was totally understandable. Think about that, man. I heard you killed a man, Mr. Garrett. Shot him down. Is that so? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I, I did indeed kill that man myself. And can you give me a reason why you shouldn't be charged with murder and hung? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, Joe Briscoe was a nasty son of a bitch, uh, agitating and quarrelsome, fond of liquor and arguing ways. And, uh, well, uh, the entire saloon had heard enough of his shit. Sounds good to me, Mr. Garrett. Case dismissed. Best of luck with the buffalo. Well, by 1878, Garrett's working at a ranch in New Mexico. By 1879, he's tending bar in a saloon in Fort Sumner, and uh, right in the middle of the Lincoln County War. And uh, Pat, like Billy, loved to gamble. And uh, he and Billy would often find themselves in the same card table in Fort Sumner. And while gambling, they earned themselves some new nicknames. Billy would call Pat, who stood at six foot four inches tall, Big Casino. And Pat would call the five, seven inch Billy, Little Casino. And they drank and gambled together numerous times over the next year or so in the small community of Lincoln County. But then, you know, Garrett got tired of all the bloodshed and lawlessness of the area. And when, uh, and when he ran for sheriff a short time later in 1880, he prioritized bringing Billy the Kid to what he considered justice. His opinion of Billy, taken from a book on the kid he'd write shortly after the kid's death, called The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, says, quote, The kid had a lurking devil in him. It was a good-humored, jovial imp or a cruel and bloodthirsty fiend as circumstances prompted. All right, so Garrett... His old buddy, Big Casino, and his two deputies uh, stumble on over to the converted Fort Sumner that July night, speak to known kid associate Peter Maxwell. And after speaking with Maxwell for several hours, Pat Garrett realized he wouldn't have to go far to find Billy. wouldn't have to go anywhere at all because Billy was about to find him. He's sitting in Maxwell's dark bedroom, questioning Maxwell over candlelight. He notices a man approaching Maxwell's room from the outside. He retreats into the shadows of the room. Garrett claimed he could see the outline of Billy the Kid. He could see a knife in Billy's left hand and a revolver in his right. Many historians think he was unarmed. Billy slowly approached the doorway, asking who was there several times in Spanish. Quién es? Quién es? Spanish would be the last language he would speak. Garrett fires twice from the darkness, first bullet hitting Billy the Kid, a.k.a. William Bonney, a.k.a. Henry McCartney, in the heart, and a Wild West legend is dead at no more than 21 years old. No legal charges are brought against Garrett since the killing was ruled a justifiable homicide. And Billy the Quid is quickly buried early the next day in a plot in between his dead friends, Tom O'Foliard and Charles Baudrois at Fort Sumner's Cemetery. But did he really die that July night? Some said Garrett had shot a different man or even conspired with Billy the Kid to stage the killing in order to claim the $500 reward money. 
That conspiracy theory gained momentum in 1950 when an old man in Heiko, Texas, named Ollie Brushy Bill Roberts, proclaimed himself the authentic Billy the Kid. I guess he switched his nickname. And petitioned new governor, uh, New Mexico governor Thomas J. Mabry for a pardon. Although the testimony of Roberts proved flimsy, doubts about the official demise of Billy the Kid remain strong, strong enough so that in Heiko today, a Billy the Kid museum continues to vouch for Brushy Bill's story. Well, we'll never know exactly the truth because a flood washed away Billy's original wooden tombstone not long after he died, 1904, so no one knows exactly where the body is anymore, making DNA testing, uh, trying to link him to Brushy Bill, or anybody else claiming to be the original Billy the Kid, uh, a huge undertaking, if not completely impossible. So in all likelihood, Billy died that night. And even if he didn't, he's still long since dead by now. Uh, he did, however, almost finally get that governor's pardon in 2010. Then Governor of New Mexico Bill Richardson, a history buff, strongly considered it, finally making up his mind right before leaving office. He says, I've decided not to pardon Billy the Kid because of a lack of conclusiveness and the historical ambiguity as to why Governor Wallace reneged on his pardon. So Billy the Kid may never get that pardon. And we'll never know all the details of his life, but we will definitely, right damn now, get us some top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the Windy Cahill murder. We'll never know exactly how many men Billy the Kid killed. He was involved in numerous shootouts with the regulators in the Lincoln County War the rustlers after the war before his death, and in a few random run-ins along the way. But what everyone seems to agree on is that the man he first killed was named Frank Windy Cahill. He of the worst nickname in the West. What was he thinking, going by the nickname of Windy? If only he knew that in future Western movies, uh, guys with nicknames like Windy always die early. Windy, Scooter, Mudflap, Fruit Loop. Those guys don't make it to the third act. You know? hey, what, what happened to Mudflap, Scooter, and Fruit Loop? Oh, they all, they all, got, they all got shot. Who, who lived? Killer, uh, Blade, Deadeye, uh, Reaper, uh, the kid. Uh, they're all fine. Number two, life in Lincoln County. Lincoln County in the mid-1870s sounds like a terrible place to live. It's high desert, cold at night, hot during the day. You had to look out for Geronimo, let Apaches. And if you're not a member of the house, you pay too much for everything, and you get too little for anything you have to sell. In a place that only has one store. You probably work in the cattle industry or some baron who doesn't give two shits about you, and you'll probably die young and poor. And there's a very good chance you get shot. The whiskey's warm, and I'm guessing the Wild West women are fairly homely. And there was no running water, air conditioning, or decent medicine. Remind me never to be a ranch hand in the 1870s. Number three, jailbreaks. Billy broke out of custody at least three times and was allowed to slip out a fourth time back at Fort Grant after that first killing. Dude was an escape artist on par with Houdini and clearly pretty likable and charismatic. Except, you know, he, he, had, a, he had a gun for his biggest tricks. He snuck up a chimney when he was a kid, slipped out of the handcuffs years later as a young adult, finally shot his way out of the Lincoln County Courthouse a few months before his death. He may have died by 21, but he died with cooler stories than any of us will ever have, no matter how long we live. Number four, the killing of Joe Grant. Billy admired the gun and rotated the chamber to an empty position on a man his intuition told him was going to try and kill him that night. A man named Joe Texas Red Grant. Then uh, that guy turned, and then, uh, you know, and he turned and shot that guy in the head when the man later drew down on him. Texas Red, man, pretty cool nickname, but not quite cool enough to keep him alive against the kid. That story alone is enough to make the kid a legend. He was a slick character, that Billy, and pretty damn wise in a lot of ways for someone so young. And number five, death of a legend? Billy the Kid was shot dead by Sheriff Pat Garrett on July 14, 1881, a man he literally never saw coming. A man hiding in the dark, hiding in the shadows. Big casino killed little casino that cold New Mexico night. Or did he? Like a 19th century Tupac, the man was so shrouded in legend, his death just couldn't be accepted. How could someone so young and enigmatic, in the dark no less, possibly while unarmed, get shot? It may be right, but it just doesn't feel right. It don't feel right. Well, like all good legends, we'll never know the whole story. And sometimes, isn't that kind of the best way to be? Time suck. Top five takeaways. Well, thank you for listening, everybody. I, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to it. And it's looking like, based on the, uh, the rate of iTunes or ratings coming in, as I said, that the next bonus episode will probably come out uh, Friday, March 10, that Friday at noon. Uh, I'll let you know for sure during uh, the, uh, next week's episode. Uh, if you want to know what the next episode of Time Suck is going to be before it comes out on Mondays, uh, please follow me on either Twitter, at D underscore Cummins, on Facebook, at Dan Cummins Comedy, 
on Instagram at Dan Cummins Comedy. I also put, uh, post tour dates there. I'll be at the Tacoma Comedy Club in Tacoma, Washington, uh, March 2nd uh, through the 4th. That's right. Going to be in, in Tacoma this week. Charlie Goodnight's in Raleigh, North Carolina, March 9 through 11. And Hyenas in Dallas, March 16 through 18. Uh, full calendar, full tour uh, uh, available at dancummins.tv. I'll be posting more dates very soon. Also, if, if you want to hear a little more about some outlaws, uh, specifically me talking about them, I'm going to be the guest host of a really fun little podcast called, why I say little? Or is, is, I don't know. How, it's, it's a big podcast. I'll be the guest host of a gigantic podcast called The Twisted Ten coming out this Thursday. Every episode of The Twisted Ten uh, is a top ten list on one subject with a twist. And this week, uh, it's me rattling off my top ten Wild West outlaws. And the twist is, I made one of them up. So see if you can spot the fake one. And that's all. That's all, y'all. Have a great week, you cowpokes, outlaws, and city slickers. Keep on sucking. You keep on sucking. Oh.